My name is Carrie Chambers, and this is where I typically would say um, I started a small nonprofit called the Care Cabinet here in Sumner County, but really it was God starting it. So I went to my son's principal and I said, you're going to think I'm crazy, but God's telling me to do something um, with schools. And so let me help in any way. And I don't know what that is, but he's telling me to do it. So what I would do is um, at the beginning of the school, kids would come in and I would give them a high five or I'd give them a hug and just give them a little bit of encouragement. You're gonna have a great day. So I saw kids coming into school with their needs being met and maybe they just had an accident. Maybe they spilled a whole bottle of Gatorade on them in the lunch, you know, at lunch and needed a new outfit. Um, and then I also saw kids coming in without their basic needs being met. So um, children that didn't have their hair brushed and they were upset over that, or children that needed a different pair of shoes because they weren't appropriate for school. Um, I also saw some children coming in, um, going from mom to dad over the weekend, and that's sometimes a very difficult transition, knowing that you're gonna go to school and go home with a different parent. And so they just needed uplifting. We have about 53 schools in Sumner County that serves 31,000 students. So there's a lot of need. Um, last year alone, the last school year, we had about 420 what we term McKinney Bento students. And those are students that don't have a permanent address. So to say there's a need in this community is um, an understatement. We have a lot of need here. We place basic care items into the first school and uh, Basic care items are like deodorants, toothpaste, toothbrush, snacks, meals. We even have clothes and shoes and socks and um, even down to little happy items. So for those children having a, a hard moment, um, staff can give them, you know, a journal or nice pen that kind of lifts their spirits right for the next eight hours of their day. And um, so that's what we put in the first school and I was like, you know, God, you're welcome, we're done. And he said, no girl, we're gonna get spicy. So the first school was when I finished my project for God, so I thought, right? And um, the school I had went to, they have needs. Every school in this community does have needs. I think that is a misconception sometimes. But I went from one school that has kind of a, a lower end of needs to one of our highest needs schools, and it broke my heart. Um, and this is where I get emotional, but you know, there's children that come to school that have horrible home lives and they are expected to sit, you know, in school for eight hours and they'll go back to that horrible home life. And so if I could give them, or, you know, this community can give them anything to help them feel God's love, right? So um, in schools today, we have to be careful uh, with what we say, but you know, we may not talk about God a whole lot in school, but we can show God's love um, always. And so our prayer, and we pray um, over every cabinet that any item that a student receives helps them to feel loved and helps them to feel that this community loves them. Um, I've been blown away at this community. There are people that pray for the care cabinet. There are people that give financially to the care cabinet. There are people that um, have drives and get items together for the care cabinets. And 100% of that goes into our schools. If you could see the little miracles that he does every day, it would just blow you away because he is big. He is big and he can use you no matter who you are. He can take you and it doesn't matter if you're not very successful, or if you think you should have um, had a special talent, he can use you in any way. Because if he can use me, he can use anybody. Amen. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about today in our time together, how God can use us right where we are, uh, where we live, work, and play. And... Um, I just want to highlight, you know, somebody emailed me, uh, emailed our team recently and said, hey, I love the vision to reach people all over the country and have an online presence where people are worshiping online, but do we have a plan for connecting people together who are worshiping in Michigan or Chicago or Florida or Kansas City uh, into smaller communities? And the answer is yes. 
Actually, we have a plan where people worship online and they gather for life groups, sometimes over Zoom, like my parents do in Chattanooga with about 25, 30 other people every week. But we also have some folks here today that are here with us from all over the country, right? Literally, who worship with Long Hollow. Where are you guys from? Like, what which states are you guys from? Just say it out loud. North Carolina, Nebraska, Florida, Virginia, and you're all in one life group? Anybody else? Okay. Is that not cool what the Lord's doing to bring people together so they worship, they gather in life group, and, um, and so we're glad you're here, and, and we're hearing stories like this uh, all over. Uh, today, I wanna talk about our vision a little bit as we continue down the road, and I was thinking last week, when you heard this vision 55 thousand legacies by the year 2035. It was probably how I felt when I was looking at colleges, just kind of a short story. I remember when I was trying to go play basketball in high school and I had done different tryouts at different schools and I had gotten the opportunity to go try out at Ole Miss. So any Ole Miss fans, hotty toddies in here today? Auburn fans, sorry. Yeah, I was pulling for the win yesterday for you. I knew I was talking about that. But anyway, I went to Ole Miss, and it was the first time I was at an SEC school. And uh, obviously, I had no business being there because they said your tryouts against, a, this is true, a 6'10 guy and a 6'11 guy. And I'm like, I think I'll go home now. I think I'm done. But I continue with the trial. But I remember sitting with the coach after, and he shared with me his vision for this SEC program. And I left excited and intimidated at the same time. And I know some of you heard our vision yesterday or last week, uh, hopefully not yesterday, last week, and you heard this 55,000 legacy vision by 2035 and 12 years, and you were a little overwhelmed by it. And if you're honest, it's a pretty big vision, amen? Who would agree? But again, we serve a big God, right? And we realize that if we aim at nothing, we're gonna hit it every time. And so we need a trajectory of where we're heading. Now, for those who weren't here last week, let me just give you a synopsis of it. The vision is broken down into four different categories. The first one is we are praying and believing that by 2035, there, there will be 25,000 people who worship on a Sunday morning with us all over the country, literally all over the world. Now you're probably saying that's a really big number. And it is, but right now, presently, we have anywhere from 12 to 12 to 13,000 anywhere, give or take, that worship every week. So it's a big number, but we don't feel like it's something unattainable. And you're probably saying, why such a big number? We believe that when people worship together, sing songs together, pray together, unite together in person, online to worship God, legacies change, amen? Like you start to build a foundation to change a legacy. But it's more than that. We're praying to come alongside 10,000 families to help you, to equip you, to learn how to disciple your children and grandchildren in the home. In addition to that, we're gonna prayerfully equip you, we feel like, to feel confident to impact 5,000 people or circles of impact in your life because obviously you live, work, and play in a particular area that is unique to you. And so we wanna come alongside you where 5,000 of us say, I look at my workplace as a mission field. That's what I'm talking about today. Next week, I'm super excited to share something near and dear to my heart personally, and that is we're praying for 15,000 people to have their lives restored. Now, restoration can come in the form of a, a freedom from addiction or drugs or alcohol or pornography. Restoration can come in the area of a marriage being restored that's hanging on by a thread. A businessman or woman in here who's ready to throw in the towel, teetering on the edge of burnout to bring you back to rejuvenation and excitement again. Or maybe it's just hurts, habits, or hangups that you're gonna break free of. Not to give away next week, but we're gonna share a vision God's put on my heart and our team's heart to really reach those who are in prison and incarcerated right now that we don't know of any church really doing anything like this in the country and we're super stoked about it. So you have to wait, not to get ahead of next week, but you don't wanna miss next week. Today, this is what I wanna talk about. I wanna talk about what is a circle of impact and how God has called us to impact and influence the people around us. Now, I wanna lay the foundation so you have to listen intently right out the gate. So just look at me for a moment. 
Every person in here has a sphere of influence that is unique to you. Here's what I mean. You know people I don't know. I know people you don't know. And collectively, we have people that we worked with that are unique to us. These are the people that live in our neighborhood. These are the parents that we sit next to attending sporting events. This is the barista that we visit every single week or every single day, some of you, uh, or the waitress or waiter that takes your order at your favorite restaurant. Think of it this way. This is the circle of impact that God has given all of us that is unique to you. Someone who made the most of her impact, as I was thinking through the Bible, like, okay, who can I preach on? What can I talk about? I thought, who is the person that best exemplifies this? And the Lord led me to Esther. So if you have a Bible, you probably say, Esther, really? Hang on. Go with me to the book of Esther. And uh, it's, in, it's right before the middle of your Bible. When I went to seminary, for those who know, I was a, was a Christian for one year. I was, I was sober from drugs and alcohol for less than eight months. I still don't know how they let me in, to be honest with you. I asked the president when I graduated from seminary, and I said, Dr. Kelly, how did you let me in after I just got set free from a $200 heroin and cocaine addiction eight months ago? He said, well, you didn't disclose that on the entrance form, and I said, well, you didn't ask. I didn't feel like I had to, right? So, but anyway, uh, but, but I say all that to say, when I went to seminary, I had only been reading the Bible for a year, and I'm in a master's level seminary course, uh, courses, and I remember the teacher saying, turn to Obadiah, and I'm like, Oba who? You know, so I'll give you a little tip. Uh, if you take your Bible and you cut it in half, that's roughly gonna give you the Psalms. You're gonna miss it by a little bit, but go left. So just turn left a few, and that's the Psalms, okay? And then Esther is more left than that, and thank God for Robert Hutchison who put the Ribbon, you know these are ribbons for market. Thank you, Rob. Okay, uh, Esther chapter four, and if all else fails, you can always go to page two, the contents, amen. Can I get an amen to the content? <laughs> I did that all the time, still do at times. Okay, uh, Esther chapter four, verse 13. Uh, we like to say word at Long Hollow. We know it's the word that changes our life. So we wanna get in to the word, the word of the Lord. Mordecai told the messenger to reply to Esther, now, Esther is the queen in a kingdom, and Mordecai is her cousin, as we're gonna find out, not her uncle, her cousin, who's gonna get word to her to do something. Esther, do not think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows? Favorite line of the whole book, who knows? Perhaps you have come to this royal position for such a time as this. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my female servants, we will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther had commanded him. Let me give you the backstory of what's happening here. Uh, the book begins with a six-month celebration from King Xerxes, which is really a, a, a community-wide, city-wide celebration. Everyone's enjoying the festivities. And then all of a sudden, he decides to call for his queen. Her name is Vasti. So he calls for the queen, and the queen resists coming to the king. And back then, if you resisted coming to the king, you could be excommunicated, killed, or just cut off a relationship with, which he did. He basically gets rid of her and decides to find a new queen. And so in an ancient Miss Universe pageant kind of way, he parades all these women before him, and he chooses, I want to emphasize this, he chooses the most unlikely woman to be his queen. Why do I say that? Esther came from humble beginnings. Go with me to Esther chapter two, and I wanna show you her background, Esther chapter two, verse seven. And it says, Mordecai was the legal guardian of his cousin Hadassah, which that's her Hebrew name, or Esther, because she had no father or mother. 
The young woman had a beautiful figure and was extremely good looking. When her father and mother died, Mordecai had adopted her as his daughter. And so she, she's an orphan. She doesn't have a family in a sense, mom and dad. And so Esther is adopted by Mordecai, who is her cousin. The CSB gets it right here. He's not her uncle, her cousin. And in the midst of this, you have this villain named Haman. Now, just a side note here. I had not planned this because of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict that was going on, but I thought it was comical. I was comical or just God's got a sense of humor as I was studying. And I started to realize this is exactly what the book of Esther is about. The book of Esther is about an evil man named Haman, and it's very similar to a group we hear on the news called Hamas. Interesting. And in the same way that Hamas is trying to exterminate or destroy the Jews, that's what Haman wanna do. Just a sidebar, if you are listening to our Forgotten Jesus podcast, we just dropped an episode that I, I recorded Monday with a man named Rabbi Jason Sobel. Anybody familiar with Rabbi Sobel? He used to go to Cornerstone a lot, I think, and, and he's been to Nashville. And so he and I became friends a couple of years ago and really close uh, since then. And so he, he's obviously a Messianic Jewish rabbi and I have a passion for all of that. Well, I did an interview on Monday. Who, who heard the podcast, anybody? Anybody heard the podcast? Who didn't hear that podcast? Raise your hand, shame on you, golly. <laughs> I'm playing, I'm playing. Uh, it, it, but it is worth going back. You can go listen to it. But here's what he does. In about 30 minutes, he describes the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I mean, amazing. It goes all the way back to World War I. It's pretty unbelievable. But he said this line that I haven't stopped thinking about. He said, do you know the first time the word Hamas is used in the Bible? Do you know this? It's all the way back in Genesis 6 when it says God looked on the world and was going to destroy it because everyone was evil and violent. Everyone was Hamas with violence. Are you ready for this? The very, the very title, the identity of the people who are attacking the Jews, the, 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 the blaring, the, the, the flashing light they're saying is we are evil. And so I want you to see it. I don't wanna get into it too much so we don't have time. But, but you gotta understand, this is way bigger than a group of people. This is way bigger than Jewish people and Palestinians. This is a battle between good and evil. That's what's bad. And we all know that every battle is in the spiritual realm anyway, right? So I'm done. That's the soapbox. And you can go listen to the episode if you're interested. But Hamas reminded me of Haman. Haman's an evil man. He is in the court of the king. He's a prince to the king. And he goes to the king Xerxes and he says, listen, I want to eradicate. I want to exterminate the Jews. I want to decimate the Jewish people. And I want to do it by you putting an edict or a law in place, which he does. So Mordecai, um, Esther's cousin, gets word to her and he says, hey, listen, Esther, you need to know something is coming down. And he's trying to convince her to use her influence, her circle of impact to make a difference. Now, I want you to remind you of two things that Mordecai tells Esther, which are applicable to us. So write these down. Number one is this. Here's what he says to her. Your life is in danger. Here's what he says. I know you think that you're in this plush kingdom and separated and immune from the suffering of the world, but your life is at risk as well. And what he's trying to show her is that by doing nothing is dangerous. Let me say it another way. When you see evil and don't do something about it, or when you see an opportunity to do good and you fail to do something about it because you think, well, somebody else will do it, or really, what can God do with me? It's dangerous and it's not right. The second insight he says is this, you need to understand you're the only hope for deliverance. You're our only hope. Now, I thought about that this week and I thought, really Mordecai, is that really how God works? Is God really saying, if you don't do it, like I've raised you up to do it and if you don't do it, it won't get done? The answer is yes and no. Mordecai is actually asking here, church, a rhetorical question. God can do whatever he wants and he chooses and does what he wants. However, God has chosen this woman at this time in this part of the kingdom to step up and obey him in this manner. And what he's saying is no one else has the platform nor the influence to do what God has called you to do. While God can use anyone, God has chosen to use you in this moment for the task at hand. Come in, come in close, watch this. I wonder how many times we miss the blessing of God because we don't do anything about it when we hear it or we think someone else will do what God's called us to do. 
See, Mordecai is reminding Esther, listen, God put you in this position. You're not here by happenstance. Listen, I know you think it's because of your beauty and you are beautiful, but there are a lot of pretty girls out there, Esther, with all due respect. I know you think it's because you have a nice smile and you do have a nice smile, he probably said, but it's way bigger than that. Esther, you have to understand, God has you here not by accident. It's for such a time as this and you can do the job that no one else can. Why do I belabor the point? Friends, listen to me. You are at a season in life I want you to get this, where you've never been before, watch this. You've never been in the past today and you'll never be tomorrow where you are today. What do I mean? You have a set of friends you've never had before. You're in a job you've never been before. You're at a position in life you've never been before. You're in a city, some of you, you've never been before. You live in a neighborhood you've never been before and you will never have this opportunity again. And God has given all of us a unique opportunity to impact people around us. And if we don't do it right now, the question is, who will? Who will? Reminds me of the funny story called, Whose Job Is It Anyway? Have you heard of this story before? It's kind of a, kind of a funny story, I, I love this. The story goes like this. There were four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job, but everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. So. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. Kind of a funny little way, yeah, it's kind of a funny little way to think of it, but, but here's the point I wanna make with this. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you have to understand this. Nothing in your life is left to chance. And I don't care if you're 16 or 60, God is sovereignly in control of everything. And when you get this, that the sovereignty of God, the providence, the control of God is like the backdrop to your life, that God is in control of everything. He created us, he sustains us, he's planned a date at the end of our life that is an, a, a date that will end our life before the foundation of the world, it's already determined, and everything in between God is sovereignly in control of. And I'll show it to you in scripture. Psalm 31, 14 says this, the psalmist says, I will trust in you, Lord, and I will say, you are my God. Now watch this line. The course of my life, your life, is in your power. Another way to say it is, the outcome of my life is in your hands. Now why do I belabor the point? Because when you understand this, it changes everything in your life. Come in close. Your job that you have is not by happenstance. Did you know that? The promotion you got is not by chance. The neighborhood you live in is not by chance. The cancer you just walked through was not by chance. The health crisis you're enduring right now, not by chance. The loved one you lost, not by chance. The raise you just got, the city you just moved into, the talent you have, the skill set you have from God, all of that is not by chance. I say it this way, there are no accidents in the economy of God. Do you believe that? No accidents. Let's say it another way. You may not be where you wanna be in life, but God will use you right where you are in life today, okay? You may not wanna be where you are in life, and obviously you have goals and dreams of it, but God will use you right where you are in life. Now, some of you are still wondering, why in the world, like of all people, of all the people, circle of impact, you chose Esther, really? Why Esther? Well, when you study the life of Esther, something really speaks to us off the pages. And that is, when you study the life of Esther, you realize Esther is just like most of us, okay? If you study the book of Esther, you realize you never find one place in the entire book of a woman seeking to discern the will of God for her life. In fact, you don't find one instance of Esther praying to the Lord. You don't find one time of Esther seeking the word for guidance. You don't find her quoting scripture or memorizing scripture or even reading scripture. In fact, if you study the book, you realize Esther is not an overt follower of God at all. 
She's not praying like Daniel. She's not preparing like David. She's not building like Nehemiah. She's not worshiping like Isaiah. In fact, the book has no mention of her spiritual life. Let me take it a step further. In the book of Esther, there is no reference to the tabernacle. It doesn't speak of the temple. It doesn't speak of the covenant of God nor the sacrificial system. In fact, the book of Esther, you ready for this, is the only book in the entire Old Testament that doesn't contain one word or one instance of the name of God, period. It's the only book that doesn't have the name of God. In fact, this is why the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Qumran community with the Essenes, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found a, a piece of every book of the Old Testament, all 39, except one, and it was Esther. Now, why do, I, why do I say that? Because all the markings of Esther point to a person who is not very religious. She's not very spiritual. There's nothing extraordinary about Esther. And yet God used this woman through the routine or normal routine mundane way of life to change and impact a nation. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, God's not calling me to impact a nation. He might not be. But God calls every born-again believer to impact their neighbors that live by him. God's called us all to use the platform he's given us and the passion we have to preach and teach the gospel to those around us. I don't want you to ever underestimate what God's doing in your present life right now, because here's how he works. He uses all of our past experiences. He uses our present sufferings and past challenges. He uses our talents and abilities. He orchestrates all events and circumstances as opportunities to share the gospel. See, Esther did what I call or, 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 or notice the, for such a time of this moment. What she did is she evaluated her surroundings and she said, okay, I realize I'm not here by accident. She prayed and fasted and sought wisdom from God and through obedience, she used her influence for God. Now, as you think of the, the life of Esther, I want you to think of the New Testament now. What chapter of the New Testament is a list of men and women who were mightily used by God, who stepped out in faith and trusted God through obedience. Do you know what chapter that is in the New Testament, anybody? Hebrews 11, if you have a Bible, turn there. Good answer, good answer, Hebrews 11. And I wanna show you this chapter called the Hall of Faith or the chapter of faith or the collection of faith. Now you could call this chapter, contextually for Long Hollow, the legacy of faith, right? because that's what they did. They left the legacy. And, and just to, for clarification, faith is not an intellectual assent of beliefs of, of ideas, okay? That, that, to have faith doesn't just mean you believe right. For the Hebrew mind, faith was always faithfulness, meaning what you believed led to action. And the reason we know that is these people in chapter 11 are not written about because they understood the difference between Calvinism and Arminianism, right? They didn't say that. Like Moses by faith could, could understand sanctification, doesn't say that. You know, Abraham by faith knew eschatology and end time, doesn't say that. They're remembered not for what they believed, watch this, they're remembered for what they did, what they did. Now, one cool insight here before I, I go to the end. Verse 13 tells us something encouraging, and that is all of them did not fully realize the investment in the moment before they died for the impact they would have after they're gone. In fact, they never saw the end of what they invested in, right? They never saw fully. Look what it says in verse 13. All of these died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised. So men like David and Moses and men like Noah and Isaac or women like Rahab or, or Sarah, we look at them as being great men and women of the faith, but we tend to forget that they had a checkered past and they weren't always how they ended. And I wanna give you this list to encourage you, but let me just remind you of some of the men and women God used. Noah, if you didn't know, was a drunk. Did you know that? Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. 
Leah was unattractive, according to the Bible. Joseph was abused and trafficked by his own family. Moses was a murderer and a stutterer. He couldn't even speak, he said. Gideon had low self-esteem. Samson was prideful. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah was too young. David was a murderer and an adulterer. Elijah was depressed and suicidal. Isaiah preached naked, go figure. Uh, Jonah ran from God. Ruth was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist was an outcast with a peculiar appetite. Peter denied Jesus. The disciples deserted Jesus. Martha worried about everything at all times, the Bible says. Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was a murderer. Timothy had an illness. And finally, my favorite, Lazarus was dead. And yet God used them all. Can I get an amen, right? I mean, that's the kind of God we serve, right? Any, why don't I put that list up there? Anybody resonate with anybody on that list, right? I know what you're saying now, but yeah, but these are men and women of the Bible. God put these names in the Bible. Now I get that. But did you know that your name's actually written in the Bible? Did you know that? No, no I'm serious. Your name actually made it in the Bible. I want to show it to you. It's at the end of, it's at the end of Hebrews 11. And the author says this, just kind of in closing, closing after this amazing chapter of faith. Here's what he says, or she says. I think it could be a woman, by the way. Another sermon for another day. Verse 32. Don't think about that. That'll get you side right. Verse 32. I should have said that. <laughs> should have said that. It's my ADHD brain, you know. Get back on track, right? All right, verse 32. He, he, he or she says, and what more shall I say? For time would fail me. He said, I can go on and on, but let me just give you the high the high uh, 30,000 foot view. Uh, I could tell you of Gideon or Barak or Samson, Jephthah of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies in flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. I love that line. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Here's your name, verse 36. Others, circle it, others, <laughs> others. Suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in sheeps and goat skins, desolate, afflicted and mistreated of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering around in deserts, deserts and mountains and dens and in caves of the earth. I wanted you to circle the word others in the Bible. It's always struck me every time I've read this passage because the word others shows us these are the men and women whom the world will never write about, papers will never document, Books will never be pinned about, and yet God knows about and God sees. Friends, the others are us. See, the others are the men and women whom the kingdom of God advances on their backs. These are the men and women that will live in anonymity and obscurity, and yet God sees you, and God loves you, and God uses you. And I don't know about you, that gives me great encouragement today. I hear it all the time, but the biggest barrier is I don't know what to do. I don't have any talents to write home about. And what people say when they're saying this is I can't sing or I can't get in front of people or I don't know enough of the Bible or I'm not a preacher, I'm not a teacher, so I don't feel like I can be used by the Lord. Let me encourage you today. Don't think of your circle of impact being on a stage or a platform. Don't think you have to have an impact with a microphone in your hand or being on the other, other side of a phone of a person taking a video of you to post on TikTok or YouTube. It's probably not in the public eye at all. Most of the time, it's in the simple steps of obedience behind the scenes when no one sees but God. And here's how the Lord works, and I want you to get this. This is how God has wired and created you, and this is how you're used by the Lord. It's praying 
to God to say, God, what am I passionate about today? And using that passion as a platform for the advancement of the gospel. For example, you start to pray about impacting those around you who share a love for football or those around you who share a love for uh, skills in woodworking or carpentry, or those around you who have a passion for classic cars, or those who love to read good books together, or have a desire to go outdoors, or, or those who like hunting or camping or golfing. If you're a coach, it's taking advantage and making the most of those kids you will never have before and never have again and investing in them. If you're a teacher, it's investing in the students that you teach. If you're a family, it's living next to neighbors you may never live next to again. Or if it's a guy's group, it's going hunting or playing golf with buddies who have never heard the reason why you are different. They don't know the difference that's made the difference in your life and you've played golf and it's speaking about that in your life. Now I know at this point you say, I I'm with you, I wanna do that. I'm amening that. I wanna give a little urgency as we close. I want you to think about your life in this category. Let's imagine you go home tonight, follow me, and God sits down with you in the quietness of your time with him and he speaks this to you and says, you only have three years left to live. Three years on earth, your assignment here is done, which is basically all of our lives anyway. We all have an assignment for God. When the assignment's done, he calls us home. But let's just say God gives you a fuller picture of your life and he says three years from today is the expiration date on your life and from that point back, I'm giving you an assignment that you have to complete. And you're like, all right, what's the assignment? God says, here's the deal. I'm sending you out as a missionary to the world. And you're like, but God, I'm only in sixth or seventh grade. We talking? No, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter grade you're in. Well, I'm 70 years old, doesn't matter. We all are being sent out. And you're like, okay, I'll start packing my bags. Where are you sending me? What country am I going to, right? What people group am I gonna impact? God says, hold on, don't pack anything. <laughs> In fact, you're not going anywhere. You're gonna be a missionary to the people you already know. You're actually staying here. See, see if God has coordinated, orchestrated everything in our lives, then it makes sense for us to start looking at the people we live with and, and the coworkers we work with and, and the parents we cheer our kids on with and, and everybody we hang out with as an opportunity to share with them why we are different, why the hope is within us and what the difference that's made. So what you do is you start thinking differently. How differently would you think this week when you sit in stands next to parents who are far from God watching your kids play sports. How different would that game be? How different would the golfing outing be with your buddies as you're now golfing together? How different would the gathering of homeschool bombs be now because you only have three years left, right? How different would the talks at the playground where your kids play on the, on the whatever those things are, the, the rides or the, 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 the playground style. How different would that be? How different would the, <laughs> I don't have kids even, the slide, the slides. How, di <laughs> yeah, I hadn't played in a while with the kid. But anyway, how different would your interaction with your coworkers be at the office? Would you get caught up in frivolous, non-eternal conversation? No, because you know you only have three years left. Well, guess what? That's Jesus's life and ministry. Jesus knew. From the start, he had three years. And he knew that clock was always ticking and Jesus made the most of the friends and the circle of impact he had. Friends, what you would do if you knew that is, you would try and build relationships and you would get to the gospel as fast as you could because you wanted them to see and think with eternity in mind. Not just to make sure they had a spot in eternity tomorrow, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit to experience victory and abundance and the life Jesus promised today, right? So here's what we're gonna do, we're gonna help you. Because up to this point, some are like, I didn't even know I should think that way. That's okay, we wanna help you. And here's what we wanna help you with this little card. So if you're at home worshiping, you don't need this card. In fact, you can draw it in the back of your Bible or your notepad, but we've given you a card. Does everyone have one of these cards? Amen, okay. So here's how the card works. It's called My Circle of Impact. And I, I, I don't know, I don't care if you're in school or you have classmates or friends or on the sports team, I want you to take this card 
and I want you to start with those closest. And, and at the end of the day or tomorrow, this week, I want you to prayerfully ask, God, who in my circle of impact needs to hear about you? And I know what you're saying. Well, I don't know how to do this. Good, we knew that. So we, we did the heavy lifting for you. We're gonna help you. This QR code is gonna give you access to videos and teachings to help you identify your circle of impact and then to speak in a natural way to those around you about the hope that is within you. As we go to the Lord, I know at this point, there are some who are saying, man, I'm thinking of people right now, a classmate, a friend, a coworker, a family member, a parent, an aunt, an uncle. Um, I wanna pray that the Lord would bring those to mind and that he would give us the courage to reach out to them. Would you pray with me as we go to the Lord? And let's just bow our head for just a moment. And if you're with us today, you can do that. Um, I want you, want, want you to ask the Lord and say this, God, who in my life needs Jesus? Who in my life particularly needs to know about the life-changing, transformative encounter I've had with you in a way that I'm not the same and I know they will not be the same as well. You know, for some of you in here, if you're honest, the first person that comes to mind is you. <laughs> you're like, you know what? what? What you're talking about, Pastor Robbie, I need. I want, I desire that. I've never surrendered my life to Christ. I've never experienced victory over sin. I've never seen God worked in an abundant way. I don't have the joy and peace and satisfaction that you're talking about. And so before I pray with you over names of people, I feel like it'd be important for me to pray with you personally. And I'm, I'm not gonna call you out. We don't have the time to do that. And, but I do wanna acknowledge before God where you are. And if you're in here today, and again, I'm not gonna call you out, but I do want you to raise your hand high and boldly now. And, and that's all you're doing is saying, Pastor Robbie, just pray for me because I need Jesus. I wanna surrender my life to Christ now. Thank you, little brother. Anyone else, would you just slip your hand up real high? I'm not gonna call you out again. I'm just gonna pray over you. Pastor Robbie, would you pray for me? I, I need to surrender my life to Christ. And today I really thank you in the back, brother. Anyone else, anybody in the balcony or in the back or maybe online? Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. Anyone else? Thank you, brother. Don't go another day without being right with God. Eternity is too long to be wrong. Anyone else? Praise God. People have already raised hands all over. Anyone else? Pastor Robbie, just pray for me. Praise God, you put your hands down. Father, I pray for those who have raised hands right now. I don't know their circumstances or their situation, but you do, and you know them better than I do. And so I just pray that you would grant them salvation, God, as they repent of their sin and put their faith in you and you alone. And that there would be a great freedom in their life, God, that, that, that the guilt and shame would be removed, the heaviness, the weight of the past would be taken away and you would replace it with unspeakable joy and show them that the best days of their life are ahead. May not be the easiest days, but the best days because they never have to walk alone by themselves. As Meredith sang so beautifully this morning, not for a moment, have you forsaken us or turn your back on us? And God, you've never promised an easy life, but you did promise an easy yoke. And so we surrender to you now. God, I'm praying for the names that you're bringing to mind even now of people who desperately need Jesus. And what they're looking for is not found at the bottom of an empty beer bottle or a pill bottle or in a bunch of sites or pictures online or on their phone, what they're searching for is found in a person. And his name is Jesus. And give us the bullet. God, we're not ashamed to tell people about the only cure for their soul. So take away that. That's a, that's a ploy of the enemy, God. Let's take away that and let us do it with joy and urgency and excitement for your glory. We ask it today in the only name we know how. And that's the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said,